Well, we continue our sermon series in the Apostles' Creed. And I'm going to ask all of us, let's recite this together. It was the custom of the early church when they were baptized that this is what they would say to one another. They would ask them what you believe. So it is listed on the screen as well as in the bulletin. Let's recite this together. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Now I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of sins, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray as we come to our time of the sermon. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day to see the lives that you're changing in our midst, to see what you're doing in the life of this body as you continue to bring more and more to be a part of this local expression of what you're doing throughout the world. So we rejoice that your spirit, the same spirit that was involved in raising your son from the grave, is at work today in the hearts of men and women and children. So we thank you that we can see visibly what you're doing throughout this world and we get a little taste of it here in our midst. And so we pray that as we hear your sermon this morning, that we would hear you speak to our hearts, that we be reminded of the power that was on display and what you would do through your son, that he would burst through and leave the tomb and become our resurrected Lord, risen and not dead, ascended to your right hand and sits on the right hand of you now and is our advocate now in heaven. And so, Lord, we thank you for the work that Christ is continuing to do throughout this world and in our lives especially. So we pray now that in the hearing of your word, your spirit would be at work, bringing salvation to those who do not know you, giving encouragement and hope to those who follow you. And may you speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can imagine the grief that was experienced by the followers of Jesus that were there on that Good Friday afternoon and witnessed what we described last week of the agony and the sorrow that went on by our Savior there that day. Now the time came that things were now silent and his death now left his followers with great fear and confusion and wonder about what would happen next because they had not really understood what Jesus was about to do. And with his death on the cross, many of them began to wonder, is, is there anything else for us? They would have forgotten some of the words that he said that he would rise again and they didn't know exactly what that meant so they were Confused by all of this, so they watched the soldiers take his body down off the cross, pulling out those nails that were going through his wrists and pulling out the nail that were in his feet. They would lower the body down and they would have the Roman soldiers hand the body over to Joseph Arimathea, who had gone to Pilate and secured the opportunity to take him and put him into a, a tomb that he had set aside and now they took that body and they wrapped it in a linen cloth. You've maybe seen the Shroud of Turin. That was a shroud, and some have said this could have been the shroud that wrapped Jesus Christ. We don't know for sure, but there's certainly enough evidence to show that it represented somebody who had been in a crucifixion because in that shroud, you can see the nails going through the wrists of the person that it wrapped and through the feet of the one that was there. And they wrapped him in this linen cloth, and then they carried him from that cross to wherever the tomb was. And the followers of Jesus went with him, and it tells us that Mary Magdalene and an, another woman named Mary went, and they sat there, and they watched all of this going on as they placed the body into the tomb. And after they had prepared it, 
they came out of the tomb and then rolled the stone back over and secured it there. It required many people to push that stone across in order to protect the body there in the tomb. And so the women watched. I wonder what they were thinking. I wonder what Mary Magdalene was saying to the other woman named Mary, and we know that there were probably others there witnessing this event. Imagine what was going through their mind, the confusion, the fear, and in the midst of their weeping and sorrow. They wondered what would be next. The very next day was the celebration of the Sabbath day, so it was proper for all of them to stop working to make sure that any that was in their employ was not working. It would be sort of like a, a day when there's a holiday in your neighborhood and you can go outside and you see how quiet and still it is because not everybody's driving off to work. In that sense, this is what Saturday brought for the people in Jerusalem. But they would have gone off to synagogue, much like we would go off to church. And they would have heard the rabbi teach from the scriptures and maybe unfold a scroll and tell the stories of God for the people that had gathered there that day. Can you imagine them as they sat there listening to the rabbi teaching from the scriptures and wondering what is happening? And then it tells us in the scriptures that the very next day changed everything. And it changed the world. It turned it upside down. And this was a day that they would remember forever. And today we celebrate it as we gather for worship right now. Because it was a day that changed the world. So if you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to turn to Matthew chapter 28. And here it describes for us the story of what happened in those days. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week... There we have it again, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. They were there a few days before watching, and now they wanted to go back in preparation. And behold, there was a great earthquake, and the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like the lightning, and his clothing was white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled, became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He's not here, for he is risen, as he said he would. Come and see the place where he lay, and he invites them in, and they go quickly and tell the disciples that he's risen from the dead. And behold, he's going before them to Galilee, and there you'll see him. See, I've told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. And ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them saying, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet. And they worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. And there they will see me. And while they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did what was directed of them, and this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain in which Jesus had directed them, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, so go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And there Matthew gives us his picture, his story of how this happened and what happened on that Sunday morning in 30 AD in the month of April. The people of God began to see something that would change their lives forever. And ever, and it's changed the world to where we even see it happening in our own day. You see, there's been many who oppose the Christian faith, and in particular, this doctrine that's taught here in the scriptures. 
they will try to tell us, you know, really, this idea of the resurrection, Jesus, it's nonsense. You really don't have to believe in this sort of thing. He, he was a good teacher. He was a good, uh, a good person to follow. His philosophy was worthy of emulating. He was like just many others. And he's dead. And if you want to have a good life, then maybe you follow the teachings of some of these people. And this is what people say today. And they would try to teach us that the resurrection is really a myth story that has arisen in the life of these followers of Jesus. They've made this story up. So you hear in the Gospel of Matthew that it tells us that the Jews who acknowledged that the tomb was empty concocted a plan and tried to tell the Roman soldiers at that time to carry on what they wanted to be taught, that the disciples had come and stolen the body. Now, if you were a Roman soldier and you had somebody who was put into your care, if you fell asleep on the job, your life was then at stake. So it's kind of ridiculous to believe that that is sort of what happened in that day. Now, most people don't believe that that's the way that it happens. What they've done, they've emasculated the Christian faith by stripping it of the power of the resurrection and have just tried to say, this is really a myth that we've really concocted for ourselves. And we believe in the resurrection spirit. God is at work doing great things. He's changing people because they've said or followed the uh, writings, but the power of the resurrection obviously is not to be seen. And the resurrection idea is foolishness. The resurrection is a hoax. And the Christians try to win one over on history. Now, what you're going to see in the Gospels is that that depiction of what occurred after the cross and his death is a historical fact. So this is confidence that you can have as a believer that what you believe isn't asking you to suspend your judgment and to abandon rationality. The scriptures are going to teach you that this was a historical fact that happened in the day of Jesus Christ. And it's going to outlay that for you. It's going to tell you the appearing of Jesus to the many. Let's just think about a few of these for a moment. The characters that are here, the first people that Jesus appears to are women. Now, that would have been scandalous in the day of Jesus Christ because women were not held in high regard. They were on the level of slaves. And if you wanted testimony against somebody in a court case, you weren't allowed to use slaves and you weren't allowed to use women. And who's the very first person that Jesus appears to? Is women. So if this was a story concocted by Christians to try to help us understand what we would do, they certainly wouldn't start with this kind of story, that Jesus would appear to women. They would have said he appeared to Peter and to James, who became the the leaders of the early church. They were certainly worthy of, of emulation, and then we should see them in their high regard. But no, Jesus shows you that he was different than our culture and in the culture of that day. And he elevated women by appearing to them. This is Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene in the book of Luke tells us that she was possessed by seven demons. And Jesus came across her one day and he cast those demons out from her. And she was liberated from that captivity. And then she began to follow Jesus and she plays a prominent role in one of the key followers of Jesus throughout all the story. You see her name appearing there over and over again. And so Jesus appears to her and another woman by the name of Mary. And it's also interesting that they're going to give you names of who the people were that they appeared to. So even in the Gospels, all four of them tell us that Joseph of Arimathea was a person who has, was great wealth. But I want to tell you a little bit more about him. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. Now, you need to remember that on the day that Jesus was put on trial, he appeared to the Sanhedrin after he went to Caiaphas's house. Caiaphas brought them in the early morning hours to the Sanhedrin, and they voted unanimously to put Jesus to death. But the scriptures tell us that Joseph of Arimathea was not there. So if there's going to be somebody that's going to represent 
those. We certainly wouldn't say Joseph of Arimathea was one that we would rely on because he was a part of the party that put Jesus to death. But the scriptures tell us that this Joseph was a follower of Jesus. He believed in him. And this is why he went and asked Pilate for the right to take the body and put him into the tomb. And so we have his name recorded to this day. And so the people who are hearing the very first gospel, which was the gospel of Mark, that probably was written 10 years after the crucifixion. So not too long later, not long enough for myth to to develop. So follow my thinking for a moment. When we think about myth, it takes years and years to establish myth. It was not possible with the quickness of this gospel written by Mark to have myth come into the story because he would tell about Joseph of Arimathea. If you want to talk to him, if you want to find out if Jesus was truly dead, go find him and he will tell you that he carried the body of Christ in that linen cloth and put it into a tomb if you doubt that Jesus Christ truly died because that was one of the other stories that I mentioned last week. That many said, well, he never really tasted death. He had some kind of chemical in his body that he was unconscious. And then when he was put into the tomb, but I again would tell you, when they wrapped that body in all of the ointment and the preparations for the body, it would be about a hundred pounds of fragrances and materials wrapped even around his face, and then that shroud would have been wrapped tightly around his face. He could have suffocated just from that as it was put into the cold tomb for three days. Oh, and you question three days? How could it be three days? Well, if it was part of a day, it counted as one day in the Jewish understanding of things. So on Friday, he was in the tomb in the evening. Saturday, he was in the tomb. And Sunday morning, he was in the tomb. So in the Jewish understanding of things, that's three days, even though it wasn't three full days that we might argue to say, well, you see, the gospels really aren't telling the truth. These are some of the concoctions of people that will say that what we hold to and what is the center of the Christian faith is not real, it's myth, and really is a crutch for those who follow God. Because that's what the atheist would say, that we who believe in Jesus, it's a crutch, it's something that we need because we're desperately broken. And somehow it's a deficiency to believe in God, and we call it a crutch. And we've heard people use that excuse over and over again. The atheists would say there is no God. And they would say that after we die, there's absolutely nothing. Well, that's an encouraging view of things, isn't it? Because every single person I have buried, whether they were a believer or not a believer, the family members will say, I will one day see them again. I have never had a person not say that when I've buried them. You see, we have this concept of an afterlife. We have this hope that there is an afterlife. When people win the Super Bowl and they give their little speech, what do they say if their parents have lost a love? If they've lost a loved one, my, I know my father's looking down at me at this day. Have you heard that before? Well, maybe we could back you up to the Academy Awards and the Grammys. And what do we hear? Musicians and actors who don't have a faith in God, but they're going to say, I know that my loved one is looking down at me on this day. Isn't that fascinating? That that's what we all hear over and again. And we don't hear the critics criticizing those that are saying those things the next day, do we? But we hear the critics talk about the center of the Christian faith, this resurrection concept, and they're going to try to tell us, well, that's just a myth. It has no validity for us today. You see, Sunday changed everything. Guards were put at the tomb and was told that the Jews asked for guards to be put there so that the Christians could not steal the body. So they then asked for a guard to be put there in that spot. Then think about who he appeared to after the women that were there. He appeared to Peter. Peter, the one who denied him three times as he stood in that courtyard and was listening to the charges brought against him. And a a little girl comes to Peter and said, hey, aren't you one of the followers of Jesus? And he said, no, 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 not me. And three times, that's how he responded. And then, then we see that in his appearance, when he comes out of the tomb, who does he go to? He goes to Peter. 
He goes to a woman who's had seven spirits within her. He goes to James, who did not believe in him until the resurrection occurred. Jesus goes to Thomas, who's one of the doubters, and he invites him to come and touch and feel his body. He tells Mary, don't wrap your arms around me because this is, I've not yet ascended to my father, but he allows Thomas to come and touch and feel and show and tell goes on in that upper room as Jesus reveals himself to his people. And so they tell you the names of these people and Mark's gospel tells you these things and then the other gospels that were written not too far later either, not long enough for myth to develop and they give you names and all the names that are there are on purpose for you to be able to say if you lived at that time, you could go and knock on their door. Tell me the story about what happened that day in Jerusalem. Even the two that were walking on the road to Emmaus. They're sitting there having a conversation and they're, wondering about what had happened and they meet this stranger along the road and they said, have you not heard about what's happened in Jerusalem at this time? And then they begin to explain what had happened. They've put Jesus, the Messiah, the man from Nazareth, this carpenter to death. And Jesus then reveals himself and it tells us in the scriptures that he took all the law of Moses and the prophets all of those scriptures in the Old Testament, and boy, would I love to have been there to hear how Jesus revealed himself and that how he was the fulfillment of all the things written in the law of Moses and the words of the prophets. And Jesus spoke to those people. Then, if you're not convinced, and some will say this, well, they hallucinated these things. Well, he appeared to 500 at one time. It's impossible for 500 people to have the same hallucination at the same time. Do you see, it requires more faith to deny the resurrection than it is to believe in it, according to the scriptural account. Because it states it as fact that this is a historical event that occurred in time, in history, and we can go back and look and see, and we can see the testimony that's offered there, so that even lawyers in our present day who've taken a look at the evidence and they have said, it's compelling and overwhelming that this is certainly a fact of what happened in that day with all of these appearings that Jesus had to Mary of Magdalene and another named Mary, to James, to Peter, to the disciples, to the 12, to the 500, to the two on the road to Emmaus. All of these are witnesses that Jesus boldly proclaims that he is now risen. And they were able to see that the tomb was empty and even the Jews admit in their concoction that the tomb was empty because they said, here, we'll give you money and you can tell people that it was, that his body was stolen. Here's the implications for us, for those who will say that it's a hoax, it's a myth, it's something that we cannot believe in. It's a Sunday that changed everything. Not only did it change the lives of people, but it changed the way that they lived. It changed the view of the Sabbath. You see, Sabbath was kept on the seventh day of the week, which was Saturday. But because of this event occurring on this particular day, on Sunday morning, it began to tell us, as the scripture said, that the people who followed Jesus began to gather and worship him on the first day of the week. This Sabbath act of the Jewish life was central to all of their thought and thinking and their way of life. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ changed the Sabbath into the Lord's day. It changed everything that day. Not only did it change the Sabbath, it changed their understanding about the sacrifices. Remember, they would offer sacrifice in Jerusalem and they would take an animal and that animal was to represent their sin and that animal was then offered up and the blood of that animal and the carcass of that animal would atone for the sins that you and I would commit because that was what was required because of our sin and our problem and our brokenness in this world. It required atonement. And so Jesus, or God, gave them a picture of what that would look like. And he told them, this is what you'll do each day in the morning, in the evening. And those sacrifices were offered. 
And then when this Sunday morning occurs and the body rises up from the grave, it changed everything. It changed the whole perspective towards sacrifices. So in due time, by 70 AD, they're no longer able to because the temple has now been destroyed in 70 AD as the Roman Empire came and conquered Israel. And the temple was now demolished and sacrificial system has been over ever since. And for your Jewish friends... They too long for a day that maybe the temple will be rebuilt and those sacrifices will be offered again because they don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. But the Christians and the followers of Jesus would say his sacrifice was perfect once and for all. That his blood is then spent and paid for us. And by his paying of our price, we no longer need any more bloodshed. That we can remember the blood that was shed in the Lord's Supper but we can understand that because Christ's work was perfect, there's no longer any more need for sacrifices because his work on that cross, his flesh being torn open as we described last week and the blood oozing from those sores on that Friday afternoon was sufficient to cover the cost and pay the price for our sin, never to be repeated again. And so it changed the whole view that Jewish people had toward the sacrificial system. Oh, it's also changed the Passover, one of the other great festivals in the life of Jewish people. Passover was the celebration of the liberation from Egypt, how God delivered them. And remember the picture that happened? They were to take the blood of an animal and paint it on the doorposts of their home. And as the Spirit of the Lord made its way through Egypt at that time, the Lord passed over all of those that had put the blood on the doorposts, who covered over them. And again, the picture of the Passover is a picture of what Jesus Christ would do on the cross for you and me. And this is what Jesus is explaining to those two men on the road to Emmaus. This is what the Passover means. I am the Passover lamb. I am the one that was slain and offered up to be your perfect hope and joy. And so it changed the Passover to now be the Lord's Supper, that we celebrate what Jesus Christ has done on our behalf. And not only did he liberate us from our sin, and now the joy that we have, the the liberation from Egypt was pale in comparison to what Jesus would liberate you and I from our sin and the power of sin and the guilt and shame that we carry when we sin and we see what it does to our minds mentally and what it does to our bodies physically and what it's done to our world. And Jesus has come and he's the remedy for all of these things. He's come to reverse the curse that was set in motion in the Garden of Eden when the evil one would try to tell Adam and Eve to take your own path, be your own God, replace him by yourself. And Jesus is the reminder, you you need him more than anything else. See, that's another story of the resurrection and what it teaches, that you can't save yourself. You needed Jesus to rise from the dead in order to show this world that the power of sin has been completely wiped out and abolished by what Jesus Christ would do there on a Friday to a Sunday. That he would be the victor. And that now when we face our struggles and difficulties in this world with God on our side, who can be against us? He's proven it by rising from the dead. He's shown himself in such a unique and powerful way. But then think about how it changed people's lives. Think about what it did to Peter. A few days later, he's standing in Jerusalem because the Lord had said, wait in Jerusalem for the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon you. And in that day, the Spirit comes down in a fire and they speak different languages and people are there and they can hear these languages that Peter and the apostles and the followers of Jesus are saying and they're able to interpret in their language even though Peter didn't know the language of some of these things that he was saying and this is the outwork and the display of what the Holy Spirit would do in the life of God's people. And on that very day, Peter, who was one who was fearful that he'd be arrested, so he denies Jesus three times, 
This is what he does. He stands up among the people in Jerusalem this day and listen to his words. Brothers, I, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on the throne. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is what he's saying. Peter is saying that David wrote in his Psalms about the future resurrection of Jesus Christ and that he would be abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this day that you yourselves are seeing and you're hearing. And listen to how he then turns it. He said, all of you, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord calls to himself. This is the message that Peter preaches a few days later. He was hiding and fearful that the Jewish people were going to come and put him into prison. And now he stands with great confidence and boldness. And he'd be arrested many days, many times because of what he would preach. And they would say, him, Peter, you cannot preach that any longer in this city. And he continued on, and on that day, 3,000 people came to believe Jesus Christ and were followers of him from that day forward. Can you imagine how long it would have taken to do the baptisms of 3,000 people? I use that as a story, as an illustration to remind us when we're worried about time, that we sit and forget the power of God that's on display. 3,000 Christians coming to Christ in one sermon spoken by a follower of Jesus Christ whose name is Peter, a denier. And now he's conquering the city of Jerusalem with the power of the Holy Spirit working through him. And the changed lives continue to go on. And the church begins in its infancy at that time to where today, now over two billion people in this, on this planet right now will say that they are followers of Jesus Christ and the same power that was at work in Jerusalem that day is at work in this world right now. Changing lives and rescuing people and liberating them from their sin because this is what the resurrection does. It's not a myth. It's the fact of what God has done on our behalf. And then listen to Peter again in his epistle. He said, blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. If you want to look at the gospel accounts and see how the resurrection changed, read their sermons, look at their lives. This is something that you cannot say had no bearing and no purpose in their life, that there was somehow a concoction, a lie, a hoax. It changed lives. And there's two billion witnesses on this planet today to describe the power of the resurrection. It changed Paul, a person who was a persecutor of God's people, And on his way to Damascus, when he was on the way to kill followers of Jesus Christ, thinking he was being zealous for God, the Lord meets him on that path. And Jesus appears to him. The resurrected Lord appears to Jesus and comes into his presence and strikes him off the horse and it turns his world upside down. And now Paul because he witnesses what has happened in this Jesus. Truly, he is the Son of God, just as the centurion said when he witnessed it that day on the Friday afternoon. So Paul then begins to turn his life upside down, and he becomes an apostle, one of the great apostles of God in the early church, a missionary, a church planter. And he goes and takes the gospel to the Western world, and it continues to infiltrate everywhere. And he said this to the Corinthians. And again, this book of Corinthians was written in a short time period, probably about 15 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now listen to how Paul interprets that work. For I delivered you as 
of first importance what I also received. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And he appeared to Cephas, who was Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. He says that so you can go and ask them, were you there that day? Though some of them have fallen asleep, some of the 500 have already passed away. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be even called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. You see, the resurrection changed everything. And one of the most compelling arguments is the lives that Jesus Christ continues to change. You see, every single one of the followers of Jesus, that band of 12, would become martyrs for the faith. If this was a concoction by the early apostles of the 12, of saying it was a hoax, let's steal his body, let's hide it, and then tell this story. But when they came to their end, and they were following Jesus, and now they were put to death, and the story tells us that Peter himself was hung on a cross, it was a, shaped in an X, sort of a spread eagle. You were put out with your arms this way and your legs this way. And it is said that in history, to mock Jesus and whom he followed, they inverted him and put him upside down in that cross, and that's how he died. And it tells you the stories of the other apostles. You see, if they had concocted this story, I think it's quite ridiculous to believe that they would go to their death believing in a lie and perpetrating a lie. I think at least one of them, if you believe, well, maybe one of them or a few of them did it, I think at least one of them would have caved in and said, hey, I want my life a little bit longer, so they spare them and tell them the story. I, I was the one who took him out of the grave and hid him somewhere in ancient Galilee. No, every single one of God's followers, of those 12, met their death by persecution and went to their grave preaching Christ has risen from the dead. And at the end of the book of Acts, it tells us that the whole world was turned upside down by the resurrection power of Jesus Christ rising from the dead. And he continues to change lives, even today. I want to read to you a description of Napoleon. I have no idea if Napoleon was a Christian or not. But I want you to hear what Napoleon wrote when he was then in captivity. And he describes this Jesus to the world. Well then, I tell you, Alexander the Great, Caesar Augustus, Charlemagne, and I myself have founded great empires. But upon what did these creations of our genius depend? Upon force, Jesus alone, founded his empire upon love. And to this very day, millions will die for him. I think I understand something of human nature, and I tell you, all these were men, and I am a man. None else is like him. Jesus Christ is more than a man. I've inspired multitudes with such an enthusiastic devotion that they would have died for me. But to do this it was necessary that I should visibly present with electric influence of my looks and my words and my voice. And when I saw men and spoke to them, I lighted up the flame of self-devotion in their hearts. Well, Christ alone has succeeded in so raising the mind of man toward the unseen that it becomes insensible to the barriers of time and space. A cross of chasm of 1,800 years, Jesus Christ makes a demand which is beyond all others, difficult to satisfy. He asks for that which a philosopher may often seek in vain at the hands of his friends, or the father of his children, or a bride of her spouse, or a man of his, bro of his brother. He asks for the human heart. He will have it entirely to himself. He demands it unconditionally, and forthwith his demand is granted. 
wonderful in the defiance of time and space. The soul of man with all its powers and faculties becomes an annexation to the empire of Christ. All who sincerely believe in him experience that remarkable supernatural love toward him. This phenomenon is unaccountable. It is altogether beyond scope of man's creative powers. Time, the great destroyer, is powerless to extinguish the sacred flame. Time can neither exhaust its strength nor put a limit to its range. This is it, which strikes me the most. I have often thought of it. This is what proves to me quite convincingly the divinity of Jesus Christ. As he sat in prison, this is what he writes to a friend. And it is a reminder of the power that was seen on that day. On a Sunday morning that changed the world forever. Lee Strobel in his book called The Case for Easter said this, the resurrection is a supreme vindication of Jesus' divine identity and his inspired teaching. It's the proof his triumph over sin and death. It's the foreshadowing of the resurrection of his followers. It's the basis of the Christian hope. It's the miracle of all miracles. See, this is why this is in the Apostles' Creed, that he rose again on the third day. He ascended into heaven and now sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Our Savior lives, and it continues to change our world. And it continues to change the way we live our life. And it continues to change us as a people. We are resurrection people who know that death could not hold him. And the tomb could not keep him in the ground. And he burst forth from the grave for you and me. A risen savior, the victor, the king of kings and the lord of the universe. And the king of your heart. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the power of the resurrection and what it continues to display even here today in our midst. For we have seen that resurrection power at work in our hearts, giving us this new life. It takes a heart of stone and turns it into a heart of flesh that now responds to you. So, Lord, we are grateful for the amazing grace we have now experienced and cherished in this world. And we pray, Lord, in the hearing of this sermon today, the hearing of your word, that if there's anyone that does not know you in this way as Lord and Savior, or may have thought this was a hoax or some kind of myth, may you speak to their hearts and reveal and open up their eyes to see the truth. So that they too would be one among the billions of people who have put their faith and trust in you. So we ask for the power of your word to be seen and evident in the life of this church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.